You're listening to the Morphology Podcast. Thanks for tuning into the Morphology Podcast. I'm your host, Kathy, aka Murph, and I am here to give tips and information about group bicycling and bicycle touring with a focus on the Midwest and hopefully provide some entertainment for you as well. Well, on the show today is Angela. Hey, Angela. Hello. So I have known Angela for a couple years, and I see her on some of our multi multi-day bike rides that we do here in Iowa. But I found out via Facebook that recently Angela did uh, a ride that's on my bucket list. I, I know I say that a lot on this podcast, but it's true. Um, but Angela, you did the Gap and the CNO trail, right? That's correct. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm so glad that you are on the podcast so that we can talk about it. Well, I'm happy to share my experience. It was a great time. Awesome. Well, let's start out uh, kind of like I do with every interviewee. Um, how did you get into bicycling as an adult? Well, my husband has been a cyclist and a bike commuter for years, and I mostly just uh, rode with the kids to the park in the trailer or did short rides around town. Uh, and one month a few years ago in April, I was feeling particularly out of shape, and I texted a friend on a whim and said, hey, let's see who can ride the most miles in April and the loser will buy drinks. Ooh. And we both ended up riding a couple of hundred miles and then just kept doing it. Um. <laughs> That's awesome. And you, we both know how April can be in Iowa. I mean, it could be beautiful 50 degree every day or it could be 20 and snowing. <laughs> we had a nice year that year, so it worked out well. Oh, um, good. And you kind of got the bug. I did. I just didn't stop. Very good. And on a side note, gosh, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, but I was riding with a group of friends and we ran into you somewhere and you were literally going bikepacking on your own to like a campground. I don't know if it was like 20 miles away. Is that, was that last year? That was, this was just June. Oh, um, it, was it, was like solstice week, it was solstice weekend. And that was my first um, like solo overnight trip. Um, and I just went um, from North Liberty to Lake McBride, so about 20 miles, yeah. dropped my stuff, did a day of brewery tours by myself, <laughs> and went back and camped. It was fabulous. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I never followed up afterwards to, to ask you if you had a good time. I did. I had a great time. Oh, that's awesome. Very awesome. Well, um, we kind of just highlighted on it, but uh, give the listeners a little bit about uh, where you live and what the cycling culture is like there. So I live in North Liberty, um, near Iowa City, and we have kind of everything. I primarily am a gravel rider, mm. um, and there are a couple of different groups that do different types of gravel rides. I have to highlight the Gravel Scouts in Iowa City because they do a no-drop ride every Monday night all summer long, and it's a super great culture. Almost every local bike shop has a gravel ride and a mountain bike ride and beginner rides and ladies' rides all summer. So there's just like, there's something for everybody. It's really great. Mm -hmm. And living in the state of Iowa, it's kind of like any Midwestern state. There are uh, hundreds more miles of gravel than there are of paved roads. So it's just a mecca if you're into that. And you can, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And I was really excited because I do ride gravel to do the gap in the CNO because I was excited about a long unpaved ride. Well, um, speaking of biking in North Liberty and in Iowa, and I mentioned um, Ragbri, I think I did, I always do, uh, you are part of a pretty cool biking team that I think that we should give a shout out to. Absolutely. I ride with uh, Team Good Beer, and we have, oh gosh, about 100 members in 14 or 15 states all over the country, um, a couple people who live in Canada and Albania, um, and we have about... 55 riders who do all of Ragbri every year. Mm. Um, and we like craft beer and we like bicycling. And so we spend Ragbri handing out craft beer and um, riding our bikes and drinking beer. And it's it's really flourished into a great set of friendships. So that's a couple of my teammates are who I did the Gap in CNO with. Oh, okay. Okay. And you guys have pretty unique kits, I would say, cycling kits. Uh, I know you have many, many different ones, but overall, they kind of look like the German. They are the Lederhosen. They yes. all look like Lederhosen. Yeah. And you have, they look like um, tiny bottle caps, but they're tons and tons of different craft brew brands. 
Yes, those are our KOM jerseys, like on the, they're the King of the Mountain jerseys, like on the tour, uh, like on the tour. Yeah. Um, you get the polka dotted jersey for the, for the mountain pass. Those are our version of that with little, but with all the bottle caps for our sponsors instead. Oh, cool. Well, I, uh, it was my first time ever being on your bus was this past summer. Um, I can't remember what the circumstances were, but it was a huge, really long day. It might have been an 86-mile day, and uh, the the guy that I was biking with, we got a super late start. I believe it was maybe 300 degrees that day. I know it was like really, it was just a tough day. It was and, hot. <laughs> yeah, and so we uh, stumbled upon uh, one of your teammates who was like, oh, just jump on our bus for the rest of the day. And it was so fun because we ended up going, we had to bike about three miles off route to find find the bus, which was so cool. It was at a golf course country club. And all of you guys, A, you were in your matching kits, but you were all sitting in lawn chairs watching people golf. Um, oh, yes. Oh my, I was there. Yes. It was, was the best day. It was so fun because as each, you know, crew of golfers would come up towards the hole, everyone did the old, you know, shh, made, you know, stop talking. And then after they would hit the ball, everyone would do the, you know, polite golfers clap. It was <laughs> hilarious. That is kind of the essence of our team. We're pretty silly. <laughs> um and we like to do silly things in mass, yeah, um, if possible. <laughs> and and not to mention the entire bus ride to the next town we were going to. Um, you guys have beer on tap, so we were. Um, I'm not going to say forced, but we were heavily encouraged to uh, drink the craft beer that you had. Which you know, of course, we were not going to complain about that. No, we have lots of craft beer. It's a, <laughs> it's a fun group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's get to this. Uh, awesome bike adventure that you were on recently. It's basically Pittsburgh to DC. Am I correct in saying that? Yes. And it ended up being The Gap and CNO. So I I don't know enough about how that mixes together. So give us some highlights about the actual route in the ride. Uh, I will do that. I'm going to first tell you how we got to Pittsburgh because lots of people have asked me that. Okay. And um, I have a teammate in Minneapolis. We met up in Chicago and took Amtrak and put our bikes fully loaded on the train. It mm. was super easy. Nice. Um, and I would highly recommend that because you go to sleep in Chicago and you wake up in Pittsburgh oh, great. and, um, and you could get on the trail. Um, so yes. So Pittsburgh to Cumberland, Maryland is the great Allegheny passage, the gap trail. And it is, um, crushed limestone, really well maintained. And you kind of ride uphill until you hit the Eastern continental divide. But like, so gradually you can't tell that you're going uphill oh, it's okay. just this like super gradual incline um and then after you hit the eastern continental divide you go downhill really fast into cumberland maryland mm. and then that's where it picks up the cno canal towpath which okay. is a national park and that goes into dc okay okay and from the photos that i've seen all kinds of history it just looked beautiful yeah, it's the towns are really historic i um I bought the, there's a, an official trail guide um, that talks about, I don't know, every five or six miles, there's a little mile marker and it has a little history of that portion of the trail oh, cool. or the town that you're going through um, or the different locks and, and parts of the canal. So that was really interesting to read beforehand um, and just kind of see what had happened in all those areas and what kind of industry had been there that led to the creation of the CNO canal, um, how that kind of, you know, went away when the railroad came, that sort of thing. So yeah. it was, it was a lot of history. I kind of studied for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were like, the, you were like the host as you got into a town. You're like, Hey, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but this happened here. <laughs> I'm just, I'm really not familiar with that part of the country at all. I, right. I grew up in Nebraska. Um, so I also watched the Ken Burns civil war documentary Ooh. as prep because some of that area overlaps as well. Oh, cool. Well, uh, let me back up here. How did you even decide to do this particular uh, bike ride? So um, I have this great bike team with people all over the country. And so I went with two of my team Goodyear teammates, one who, like I said, lives in Minneapolis, who has wanted to do this for quite a few years and is an experienced bike packer. Um, and then another one who lives 
um, just outside of DC and rides the CNO and has ridden this um, entire route several times. Mm. So we decided we would meet up and, and do the whole thing. Oh, that's awesome. And you mentioned um, at least part of the trail is limestone, but um, and uphill, your first segment. Uh, describe like the terrain. Um, so, yeah, the first part um, on the Great Allegheny Passage, crushed limestone um, and some railroad bridges, some really beautiful bridges. Uh, it was a great time of year to go because you're going sort of up into the mountains mm. and the trees are changing. It was just gloriously beautiful and then like I said there's some incline but it's not much Mm -hmm. um in a 60 mile day it was maybe 400 feet of climb oh okay so it's just super gradual super it just looks like a flat trail Mm -hmm. um until you get really close to the divide and then it's a little bit up but never like a hill Mm -hmm. um (laughs) and then um once you get on the CNO it's a little bit rougher because it is mostly just a dirt path, packed dirt. Um, some places have some crushed limestone. As you get closer to bigger towns, there are probably paved portions into and out of towns mm-hmm. um, where it gets used a lot by the, the people who live there. Um, and that was a little bit rougher. There were some ruts and some tree roots. I think because I mostly ride really terrible Iowa gravel, that didn't bother me too much. Sure. Um, we had rain, and so the mud on a heavily loaded bike was a new thing for me. So oh, that was gosh, felt yeah. a little sketchy, but I didn't ever fall down. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And I don't know, like I've experienced this, experienced this in the last couple of weeks. Um, you go through a little bit of mud, and I have fenders on my bike, so immediately all of that mud cakes into the fenders, and then you don't realize it until you're moving along, and you're like, why can't I get any momentum anymore? And then you got to find a stick and get all that mud out. So I don't know if that happened to you. I I don't have fenders. I had kind of like a mud flap on the front. Oh, um, yeah. But um, like you would almost have on a fat bike that just kind of clap, you know, snaps on. But it definitely when it's wet and it's not paved and there's not like the drainage of limestone, it is a bit of a slog. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it you just don't feel like you're getting anywhere, but you just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was your total mileage? Um, we ended up with about 360 miles. Um, our last day was steady rain. Um, so we cut off of the CNO a little bit early um, to take paved roads to our friend's house just outside of D.C. Mm. Um, and then rode from there back to um, the Washington Monument the next morning. So we kind of backtracked our way back into D.C. at the very end. Mm-hmm. Um, but we ended up with about 360 miles. And how many days did that take? We rode for six days. Oh, okay. Um, okay. We had planned to try and do it in five and we had a, like our second day was a half day rain delay and then the last day was just 60 miles in, in pretty steady rain so it wasn't fast mm-hmm. um so I was glad that like we had planned a little bit of extra time yeah um, yeah just to have a little breathing space right and uh again I don't know the um setup of that trail I assume that there's you know small towns here and there but did you camp hostel hotel airbnb um, we camped, um, with the exception of one night, um, but for the most part, there are lots of little hiker-biker campsites, especially along the CNO portion. Mm. They're like every five miles, and they have a porta potty and a fire ring and a picnic table um, and places to pop your tent. And oh, those perfect. are, for the most part, free, too. One of them in uh, Connellsville, Pennsylvania, had little Adriandac shelters that you could put your stuff in. And oh. so you didn't have to, like, set up your tent. They're super cute. Very nice. Um, so we did, um, when we came into Cumberland and had had a pretty cold day and were three days without showers, um, did spring for a hotel that night and <laughs> washed our laundry. Um, it's right on the trail. So there was a bike wash station we walked into the hotel and they handed us rags to wash our bikes. Um, like you people are dirty. <laughs> Please clean everything. But then you could you could actually park your bike inside. Um, they had bike racks in the stairwell on the first floor, so you oh. could bring your bikes in and lock them up. And so so that was great. And I bet that shower felt amazing. It was the best. <laughs> uh, do you recall any like favorite towns or places that were just like wow? I got to go back here. 
I really did like Cumberland. That's probably where we spent the most time just kind of hanging out. We were mostly on the trail. Um, but when we got into Cumberland that night, we found a brewery, ate our weight in Chinese food, mm. played cards, um, and then had those excellent showers. Um, Shepherdstown, West Virginia was also really fun. We went um, across the river into there um, and had some great food. Um and I would definitely like to spend a little more time there, too. It was mm-hmm. a cute little town. And how about, uh, I, I like to ask this one to everybody who goes on overnight trips, but any mechanical issues or flat tires? I know you mentioned the rain, which it, you haven't said anything negative about it, but I'm sure that it was <laughs> like, oh, man, is it ever going to stop? Um, we did have, like, we didn't have any flats, no huge bike mechanicals. We lost a bolt for somebody's seat, but there was still one bolt holding the seat onto the seat post mm. and we used a zip tie until we got to a bike shop and got another one. Oh, perfect. Um, and we did have like, we had one day where we waited out a rainstorm for about half of a day. So we had some short miles. Um, we had some cold nights where it was about 30 degrees. So mm. that was more extreme camping than I had hoped for. Yeah. And then, like I said, the last day we rode in rain, which it was mid fifties. So not terrible. I, I used all the clothes I brought and it was perfect. (laughs) (laughs) And not many people can say that because, you know, I was just going to mention when you're bikepacking or touring, you know, space is limited. So everything, every ounce of space is so precious. And I was just thinking to myself, man, if I knew I was going to stay in 30 degree weather, I would probably sacrifice some space for a second sleeping bag or something warmer. But then, like you said, you know, you ended up wearing everything. So you must have planned it pretty good. I felt like I didn't have anything super excessive. Mm -hmm. Um, Like the people I went with probably would disagree with that because they're like, <laughs> why do you have so much stuff? But um, I had brought a, like a little puffer jacket that um, goes into a little, you know, six by three inch tube and um, slept in that some nights and that was perfect. And I have a, a big Agnes sleeping bag that has a pad on the bottom instead of insulation that slides in. Mm. And I had sprung for the more insulated version of that uh, before I left, just in case it was cold. And I was really pleased with that choice. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, well, as long as we kind of started talking about gear, do you want to give the listeners just a, a highlight of your bike setup as well as your gear setup? Absolutely. I have a Salsa Warbird, which is a, a gravel race bike. Mm. So the, the caveat of that is that it does not have any rack mounts. Um Oh, no place to bolt anything on. Um, so I, um, I used a front roll system that I put my tent on the handlebars and it has drop bars, but, um, my tent is small, so I could put it between, um, from a company called, called outer shell adventure. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I put my tent up there and then I have a seat post rack, um, from Blackburn that is a little bit limiting in weight. I can carry about 25 pounds on that, which is all, um, and I had a set of Ortlieb panniers, which were excellent. Nothing got wet. And so that turned out to be like an efficiency of packing mm-hmm. challenge for me. But it worked out okay. Good. Um, and like you said, you pretty much used everything that you brought. So that's a that's a big deal. I Yeah, I felt like there wasn't anything that I, I wouldn't bring again. Like the things I didn't use were spare bike parts, like a drill, your hanger, that I would bring again anyway, even though I didn't yeah. use them. Yeah. Um, and I had a uh, 38 millimeter gravel King tires set up tubeless. And I thought that they were great for the terrain. I, I read a lot of things that said nothing below 35. And I think 38 to 40 is probably perfect. And uh, something I always ask everyone I interview, but uh, did you have any luxury items packed that maybe eh, you probably didn't need, but you couldn't go without? Um, well, we did. I brought the trail guide book. Um, yeah, that's the right. trail guide. Um, we had a deck of cards that we picked up on Amtrak, which was fun to just kind of hang out, especially on rainy nights. We found out that um, if you sit up in my one person backpacking tent and stick everybody's legs in the vestibule, <laughs> you can put three people in there. Um, and we did that. And then we we then used our other luxury item, which was several flasks of um fine spirit um (laughs) (laughs) and um so that was how we we whiled away our rainy cold night um 
And so that turned out to be luxury items that were perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those are definitely uh, on the, li- the high list of luxury items. So, Well, looking forward, do you have any uh, adventures on the horizon? I don't have anything big planned out um, for next year yet. Um, there'll be the July ride, whichever that turns out to be, mm-hmm. uh, in Iowa, uh, I'm sure. And we've got some teammates in Denver. Um, So I'm hoping that my husband and I can get our bikes on Amtrak and head out that way uh, and hang out and ride with them sometime. Mm -hmm. And I've heard, um, I've interviewed people before about uh, the Amtrak, you know, taking your bike on Amtrak. And you were right. I have heard nothing but good things. Um, I know you can get like a 30 day pass. I don't know if that's what you did. And then you can just get on and off whenever you want for that 30 days, you know, for a fee. Yeah, I've I've met people who've done that. I yeah, we just had, you know, our direct ticket and but even then it was the bike ticket that you, the add-on was $20 each way, which is so much easier than flying cuz you don't have to break your bike down. Yeah. It's not $100 to fly with it, you know. Yeah. It was it was easy. And you said you didn't have to um, dismantle it or take the bags off or at I all. didn't have Yeah, we didn't have to take any bags off or anything. We literally just rolled it on and leaned it up against the side and got it when we were done. Wow, that's great. (laughs) Well, um, of course, we would both recommend Amtrak to people just based on how we've been raving about it. But would you recommend to people who maybe want to try out the Gap or the CNO, would you recommend that they try it? Oh, I really think that people should give it a go. If you're looking at a trip, there's there's, a, I think, a lot of different variations of intensity. You don't have to do the whole 360 miles. There's mm-hmm. quite a few places to start and stop. I have other friends that have done it um, with, uh, like, a SAG service. So they did, like, Airbnbs or bed and breakfast mm. and um, had most of their stuff kind of ferried along the way. Um, so there's a ton of options. And I am absolutely a novice at this. I had done two overnight trips with my loaded bike before <laughs> this oh, ride. Before this one? Before this one. Oh, I did my goodness. Um, one f- last June and one last March. Um, so just the two overnights that weren't really out of town very far at all. Um, and and I survived. So yeah. I think if I can do it, I think anybody can. The riding isn't intense or hard. You don't have to go fast. Well, I can say you definitely embraced it for somebody who has not experienced that. I mean, here you are in more than one day of rain and, you know, I'm already picturing three people, you know, hovered in a little tent with it raining and (laughs) sipping off your flasks and playing cards. Like, that's like the perfect night. There were no bugs. There were absolutely (laughs) no bugs (laughs) because it had been cool and it had been a little cool before that. If I did it again, I would still think I would do it about the same time of year in mm-hmm. October because the the trade-off for the potential of it being a little bit cold is that the leaves are changing. It's just really beautiful scenery. It wasn't hot. And the days that it didn't rain were about 70 and perfect. How beautiful. Um, you could ride in shorts. And um, so I think we just had, you know, luck of the draw that we had a little bit of a cold front for a couple of days, but you just got to roll with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I like that this trip, you know, it's you could take a week off work. And as long as you can get there, you know, it takes a couple of days mm-hmm. of travel to probably get there. But um, it's not like riding across the United States in four months. I mean, you're actually it's something that's doable. Yeah, I think. And, and there are lots of rental places. So if you don't want to take your bike there are lots of services that go back and forth each way so you can pick up a bike and ride it and kind of drop it off at the end there's lots of ways to do it even if you don't have a great way to get your bike out there because I think that is is a big part of the dilemma is how do I get my bike to the beginning well cool thank you so much Angela for being on the show and I I really think that I have to do this ride in 2020 I think that you should do it. It was so much fun and um, it was just kind of easy and relaxed. Uh, Yeah, It was really interesting for me to watch the terrain change, like different kinds of trees that I'm not used to seeing. um, And then it changes as you go too. So awesome. um, Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. 
Well, how about a touring tip? This week, I'm responding to some listener email. Steve emailed in and asked, is there really a difference between flat pedals and clip pedals when it comes to tour riding? Well, thanks for the email, Steve. And the short answer to your question is yes. Yes, there is quite a difference between the two styles of pedals. So the two types of pedals most commonly used are flat pedals and clipless pedals. There are plenty of pros and cons to both styles, but before I get into that, I want to define each. A flat pedal is pretty self-explanatory. It's a standard pedal, probably what was on your first bicycle. Each side of the pedal has a flat, wide surface to rest your feet. Now, a clipless pedal is a confusing description for a pedal that requires your shoe to clip and lock into. The clipless pedal was originally named to distinguish it between a different style of pedal system called toe clips. Toe clips are a cage-like frame that attaches to the front of a flat pedal and it surrounds your toe area. So literally a clipless pedal does not have a toe clip. I know it doesn't seem to make sense to keep calling it clipless, but here we are. Okay, so a clipless pedal is much smaller than a flat pedal and it requires a special shoe that has a built-in cleat. Think ski boot clipping into a ski. It's kind of like that. To get clipped in, the rider slides their shoe onto the pedal and locks the shoe into place. To unclip, simply push the heel away from the bike and the shoe will pop out. When riding your bike on a tour, most of that ride relies on controlled pedal power. Most clipless pedal fans will say that you can pedal faster and pedal with more power when you're clipped in. Since you are literally attached to your bike, your cadence tends to be more fluid. And since your foot can't separate from the pedal, you're able to both push and pull as you pedal, and this combined effort gives you more efficiency and most likely increased ability to accelerate. There are quite a few clipless pedal and cleat systems out there and are designed for specific types of riding. Two types I will mention are the actual cleat system. There's a two-hole cleat, and this is most commonly used by touring cyclists and commuters. With this system, typically the cleat is recessed into the shoe, so you can easily walk in these shoes when you're off the bike. The sole also has grips, so they feel more like a regular shoe. The three-hole cleat system is more for road biking and racing. Your feet don't move at all once the shoe is locked in, which makes it even more efficient at transferring power. The downside is that this cleat protrudes from the bottom of your shoe, so walking is very difficult. If you choose these, have an extra pair of shoes to use when off the bike. So back to the flat pedals. There's nothing wrong with using this style of pedal. It's what you use when you learn to ride your bike. You can wear about any shoe with this style of pedal and transitioning from bike to walking is a piece of cake. The pedal provides a nice wide stable platform for your feet and you have the luxury to wiggle your feet around whenever you need to. The cons with the flat pedal is that you don't have the ability to both push and pull on each pedal stroke, which can affect your performance on a long ride. Also, your feet may slide around if you're aggressively attacking a hill. I've mentioned the pros to having clipless pedals, but along with the increase in performance, there are a few risks to consider. First off is the dreaded slow motion, embarrassing fall when you forget to clip out at a stop. It happens to almost everyone. And yes, it's happened to me. And yes, it is embarrassing. Another con is the pedal. It's much smaller than a flat pedal and it's meant for shoes with cleats. So if you forget your bike shoes, you'll probably have an uncomfortable ride trying to pedal in regular shoes. So to sum it up, flat pedals make for an easy dismount, they don't require a special shoe, and they provide a nice, wide, and stable surface for your feet. The clipless pedal gives you more efficiency and more control. They also lock into your bike, which provides a more secure connection. Pedals can make a difference in your ride, and one note on options, there are multi-platform pedals available. So if you want to give clipless a try, these pedals have one side that is clipless and one side that is a flat platform. Definitely worth checking out. That's this week's touring tip. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Check out morphologypodcast.com to find all kinds of great info and email me at morphologypodcast at gmail.com. I appreciate your time today and thanks for tuning in to listen to the Morphology Podcast. I'll leave you with this quote from the unwritten book of Morphology. This quote comes from the Dalai Lama. There are only two days in the year that nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. 
So today is the right day to love, believe, do, and mostly live. Think about it.